going to help people today. We're going to simplify some things today about God and about faith and prayer. Uh, you know, one thing about real Bible teaching is it ought to simplify spiritual things enough for you to understand them, right? right. Sometimes people look at the Bible and they think, wow, it's so confusing. I can't, can't discern it, can't understand it, can't interpret it properly. But if it's taught properly, you will, un you will understand. You will be able to interpret it. It'll make sense to you so much that you can apply it tomorrow. And that's our goal, is to help you apply the truth of God for your, your everyday life. I mean, sure, I like to have fun in church, and we like to put a big thing up and have a big time together, okay? But this, there's an effect of this. There's a goal for these meetings. It's not just an end in itself. Right. Yep. There's a couple ends in it, but it's not the end in itself. The end in itself is that you walk out of here with the glory of God so much that it remains tomorrow. Thank and the rest you. of the week. And that, that all through your life, every day, you, you are exemplifying Jesus Christ and in contact with the Almighty God so that your life is successful. Yes. That's what it's all about. Yeah. That's, the, that's the real bait to get people in the kingdom of God is that God can be part of your life and impact your life on a daily basis. Yeah. So much that He'll even speak to you and talk to you and guide you and answer you. Yes. Spend a life together with you, and that's what we're after. Uh, nothing else makes any sense. Religion, just for religion's sake, is nothing. Right. Religion, just to follow some traditions and go through some motions with a bunch of people doing the same thing, means very little. Uh, or we could just say it means absolutely nothing. Yes. Right. Amen. That's right. Right. Yeah, that's right. Yep. But religion that gets you to God and changes the nature of on the inside of you does mean something. Yeah. Amen. When God gets hold of your life, uh, then it begins. Yeah. yeah. All the stuff people look for in life, uh, it never lasts, it fades away, it's temporary. One night on the town is over. Yeah. When? Two eight, when the lights come on, it's over. Glory. Yeah. Amen. Life with God, light on the inside, joy everlasting, joy of the Holy Spirit is eternal. Yeah. Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Yeah. That's why the scripture says, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. So, here we are. We're, that's not the message for today. That was just the, uh, the appetizer. <laughs> Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, chapter 16. This is Jesus. He's talking to his disciples. Before he goes to the cross, this is some of his words. John chapter 16. Now up until this time, Jesus has been doing everything for the disciples. They come to him if they need something. But Jesus is, uh, things are changing. He's transitioning out as, as the earth leader. And he's becoming the mediator between God and men. And here's what happens. He says, verse 23... John 16, 23, And in that day you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, He will give you. Until now you've asked nothing in my name, ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. All right. Now if we just read it like that, I mean it kind of goes in. It's like, okay, He's going to teach a message on this. But let's take a look at the Scripture again because if you'll read the Bible this way and get your eyes on it and let it sink into your heart... And let your spiritual ear hear it. And let it rattle you on the inside. And let it convince you that it's true. Then things will start happening for you. Yes. Yes. All right? Now look what he said here. John 23, I mean 16, 23. Jesus said, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Whatever you ask the Father... In my name, Jesus said He'll give to you. Okay? Whatever you, whatever you ask the Father in the name of Jesus, He'll give to you. Whatever you ask the Father in the name of Jesus, He'll give it to you. We need to say it about 50 more times. So that we realize, oh, it's very simple. Getting prayers answered is very simple. Having God answer your prayer is very simple. He said anything, Jesus said, anything you ask the Father in my name, He'll give it to you. He'll give it to you. And so what this does is it, is it, it, it presents a trust factor in God that's so simple. So simple. 
Not necessarily easy, but simple. You've heard us say that before. Not, not necessarily easy because it's spiritual, but so simple. So childlike. Whatever you ask the Father in my name, He'll give it to you. So you need to pretend that Jesus said those things to you. Face to face, mouth to mouth, ear to ear, or mouth to ear. Uh, whatever you ask the Father in my name, He'll give it to you. And that's what I want to talk about today to help you simply trust God easier. Sometimes we get so worked up, so doubtful, so uncertain, uh, so stressed out, trying to work it up, trying to pray it harder, trying to please God enough, trying to get a prayer answered, when really it's very simple. God has always wanted us to trust Him. He's a Heavenly Father, and He, and he wants us to trust Him. Yes. I mean, the worst thing for a father is if the children don't trust. Because if they don't trust, they don't obey. Right. Our Heavenly Father wants us to trust Him. He needs us to trust Him. It makes Him happy when we trust Him. He's not all that happy when we don't trust Him. He's still your Father and He still loves you greatly, but golly, He's like, oh, come on. Uh -huh. yeah. Isn't that right? Yeah. You keep swinging at the ball with your eyes closed. <laughs> You ever played Little League ball or had a kid play Little League ball? In the, in the beginnings, they're kind of scared of the ball, so they close their eyes and swing. Uh, that's how Christians are so many times. We, we try to live the Christian life without trusting God. We want to trust Him. We want to hit the ball. We, we, we're not trusting Him, though. God needs us to trust Him. Matter of fact, He said, without faith, it's impossible to please Him. Remember Hebrews eleven six. 6? Yes. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. That's not saving faith, because you wouldn't even be in the, in the game. But without faith, it's impossible to please God, for he that comes to God must believe that He is and that He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Uh -huh. So in coming to God, you have to trust. You have to be absolutely sure and, and certain and trust. And it's so simple. It's so simple to, to realize these scriptures simply mean, ask in the name of Jesus, and He'll do it. Every one of us has to get to that simple place of after we've prayed in the name of Jesus, walk off with a glad heart. I've been through it. My first couple years with the Lord, I had to practice this. I saw these truths. I worked it up. I worked it out. And, and I remember going through these phases of uh, asking God for things and worrying. Kind of stressed out that, oh, I hope it works. Oh, I just hope this works. They said it would work. But then I finally broke through to this place where, you know what? If I asked God in the name of Jesus, I know He heard me. That's right. And then it's over. It's over. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. Yeah. And I can go ahead and act like it's over. Yeah. Thank you, I can go ahead and walk off happy. I can walk off praising God. I, can, I don't have to re-pray. don't have to rethink about it. Don't have to worry the next day. It's done. He said if I ask, He said anything. Anything. Right. Whatever you ask the Father in my name, He'll give it to you. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. Try that a couple times. Just in a simple manner. Go to John 15. Oh, and notice this. He, he said, asking you will receive that your joy may be full. You know, this whole thing is to bring... It's not just to bring the car into the driveway. I need a car in Jesus' name. Your joy is full, not only because you got some wheels, you don't have to bum a ride, but your joy is full because your Heavenly Father answered you. Yes. Yeah. Amen. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Look at what John 15 says. Jesus, verse... verse uh, 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. Stop there. Notice getting your prayer answered is called bearing much fruit and it glorifies God. Asking God for the car, getting Him to actually trusting God and asking Him for a car that He then provides gives Him glory. Yeah. Even if nobody else knows what happened. You getting your prayer answer glorifies God. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. 
But notice how it happens. Verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you'll ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. Glory. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. There is a stipulation. Okay, there is a stipulation about His Word. We're going to get back to that in a minute. If you abide in Christ and His words abide in you. We're going to get back to that in a moment. That's the stipulation. But notice, whatever, what thing soever you desire. Yeah. Whatever things you desire and it shall be done for you. Sometimes we need to desire things. Isn't that right? Yeah. We need to desire things. Sometimes we're not really desiring things. We're running through life so fast. We're, we're praying little quickie things. We're hoping things kind of work out. We're tossing up a few things to God. And, and we kind of want this to happen. And we kind of really want this to happen. But our desire for God to do it is just not there. So we'll just pray a little quickie as we go solve the problem ourselves. What things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you'll have them. Mark eleven twenty four. Remember that? What things soever you desire when you pray, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask whatever you desire. So what do you desire? I remember one of the first times I... I well, maybe not the first, or maybe, but one of the first. First couple years with the Lord... Um, my dad, had he was traveling from out of town, and he had come home, and he had a knee problem. Something had happened with his knee. He had some pain and chronic pain, and he couldn't walk right without pain. And uh, he asked me to pray for him. Now, that was like the first time he's asked me to pray for him since I've come into the kingdom. And so I'm trying to pull all the family and all the friends into the kingdom of God, and this is important for me. He's now asking me to pray for him, so I want a miracle, right? And so I prayed in the house in the name of Jesus, and, <clears throat> and then I had him... Uh, run around a little bit and see how he felt. That's what we usually do once we sense something has happened. And he, he did it, but he felt the, the pop was still there and the pain was still there a little bit. And that was about it. And so I left that day and the next, that was the weekend. So Monday, <clears throat> I'm driving my car and he's going back out of town. And this came up to me. And I, and I was just kind of nervous about it. You know, sometimes you do this, you, you put God on the line, you put yourself on the line, you put your word on the line, you put your prayer on the line. And we around we, we people here the faith we faith people, we expect things to happen. Yeah. Right. We're not this sovereign this black hole God is sovereign black box group that just tosses everything in. Well, we prayed and whatever God wants to do. No, we actually believe He meant what He said. Yeah. We actually believe Jesus. I mean, Jesus said, if you ask the Father in my name, He'll do it. Yep. He'll give it to you. Right. <clears throat> and so. Um, I was driving in my car, and I started getting a little nervous about it. Like, oh, I sure hope he's healed. I sure hope he's healed. And then it dawned on me, no, I really want this. I really want this. And I began to just call out at the top of my lungs and just cry out, no, I rebuke that sickness. I rebuke that pain. Come out of him. And I just began to pour my heart out to God. Have mercy on him, God. Have mercy on him. I asked. I asked. And I expect that knee. And in Jesus' name, do this for me, God. And I just, for, you know, maybe three to five minutes, just poured out my soul. And, and after the fact, I realized, you know, I, I have a desire for this. And then it was done. And I felt good in my heart after I did that. And uh, maybe several weeks later, um, I, I asked my, my dad. I didn't talk to him for a couple weeks. And two or three weeks later, I asked him, I said, how's, how's your knee? I never heard. He said, oh, it went away that week. <laughs> the pain went away that week. I think God loves to, he loves to do stuff for us. He loves to do stuff for us. Some people think, well, if he loves it so much, how come he didn't do it for me? Because you got that attitude, that's why. Because <laughs> you're all stiff-necked, that's why. You're already bitter against God. You hadn't even used your faith yet. If you actually trust God, he'll never fail you. If you trust God, he'll never fail you. Never, never, never will he fail you. If you actually trust him, he'll never fail you. If you actually have faith, he'll, you'll get the answer. If you have faith, you'll get Amen. the answer. Yes. When Jesus saw their faith, the miracle happened. Yeah. When Jesus sees your faith, the miracle will happen. If the miracle hasn't happened, he hadn't seen your faith. Amen. Amen. Right. And I know it's like that, oh, now we're talking about people's faith and they get real sensitive about it. But in the Bible, when people, when Jesus, or we can say when God sees people's faith, they get the miracle. They do, yeah. 
when Paul perceived the man had faith to be healed, he said, stand up on your feet. Yep. Yeah. When God perceives you have faith for whatever you need, boom, there's the answer. Yeah. Okay? So we've got to be real honest with ourselves and recognize, you know, our trust factor needs to get a little, little more powerful, a little more simple, a little more anchored, yeah. Yeah. and a little more determined. Mm -hmm. God meant what He said and said what He meant. This is a big deal to God. He wants us to trust Him. He needs us to trust Him. That's why He wrote the Bible for us. Yeah. That's why He gave us so many exceeding great and precious promises that by these you can be partakers of the divine nature through the knowledge of Him. And so God has told us things. He's explained Himself. He's given us His Word. He's given us His will. He's told us what He wants. He's promised to answer. He's promised to do things. He's got tons of if-thens, if-thens, if you do, if this, if this, then this, if this, then this, if this, then this. If you have faith and without doubting. If you ask, believing. Yeah. If you have faith and doubt not. Yeah. So many of those, so many of those. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, then you'll ask what you will and it shall be done. Yeah. If then, if then. He, he means it. He's absolutely always going to answer His word. Yes. Isn't that exciting? Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Turn to um, Psalm with me. Let's read a couple things. I just want you to have faith in God here. I just want you to be able to trust Him. I want you to be able to put your trust in God. Trust in God. Real trust. If you really trust God, you won't be afraid of anything. If you really trust God, you'll know and you'll have confidence and you'll be happy on the inside. Psalm 34, <clears throat> verse 4. Psalm 34, 4. I'll know you're there when the pages stop turning. If you know where Psalms is, just stop turning and then we'll think you know where Psalms is. <laughs> hey, I haven't said that in a while. Let me say that. If, if, you're, if you're not real familiar with the Bible and we go through this turning exercise in church and you can't find the book and, you know, we've all been there where, where I'm turning and turning. It looks like I'm, oh, I'm getting nervous because everybody's stopping and I haven't found the book yet. And so you just kind of stop and you're over in Lamentations way <laughs> off. And you cover up the top so nobody knows which one you're at. You just act like you're in it. We've all kind of been there and it's a little bit embarrassing, but I just want you to know that you, you, you're, everybody's been there. We've all been there. Don't be embarrassed. Do what you got to do. If you want to keep looking, look. If you want to stop and fake it, fake it. Doesn't matter to me. God's not mad. We're not mad. Nobody's looking at you funny. Eventually you'll learn the books of the Bible. I didn't grow up knowing the books of the Bible. It took me a while. I got me a Bible that had the little tabs on the side. Actually, it was the indentations. Helped me learn the books. Uh, so you'll get there, all right? Bottom line is, get a Bible, learn your Bible, be familiar with your Bible. If you use a digital Bible, read your Bible, learn your Bible, get familiar with your digital Bible. And if you're going to use a digital Bible, you've got to find a way to underline and mark things. So whatever it takes, find an application, a, a phone app that will let you be able to highlight and bookmark every important passage because you're going to need it again. Yeah. I see you're all enthused yeah, about that. Right. But if you're not bringing a Bible to church, uh, you need to. Yeah. You need to bring something that you're familiar with, either a book or a digital thing, but you've got to know your digital thing if you're going to use it. My Bible's got all the good scriptures marked. Yeah. What do you mean? Some are bad scriptures? <laughs> Somebody saw John Osteen's Bible one time. Y'all heard the story? They looked over and saw John Osteen's Bible. And they said, Brother, you've got every single scripture underlined. <laughs> he said, Yeah, I only, I only underline the good ones. They said, But they're all underlined because they're all good. I mean, if you go over to Le Leviticus, it, it won't be all underlined. <laughs> Okay, back in. Here we go. Psalm 34, verse 4. I sought the Lord and He heard me. Yeah. 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 Woo. Woo. <laughs> but you got to keep reading. You know, there's bumper stickers in, in the city that say God listens, right? Everybody knows God's listen. 
God listens. We, everybody, every, even heathens and even atheists could not. Oh, an atheist wouldn't think that he's hearing anything. <laughs> Unbelievers can admit that God listens. But every real Christian ought to go a little further and say, well, if he's listening, will he answer me? Yeah. 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 So we really need bumper stickers that says, God answers. Yes. Amen. I sought the Lord and he heard me, delivered me from all my fears. Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. They looked to him and were radiant. Their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried out and the Lord heard him and saved him. Out of all his troubles. God will save you out of all your troubles. If you'll cry out, it doesn't mean loud, it just means with your heart, your heart has to be loud about it. Your heart has to desire it. He'll save you out of all your troubles. I'm sure you, you don't have any, but if you did, he would save you out of your troubles. You gotta know that though. You gotta believe that. No matter how confusing and difficult the challenge is, the trouble. Just get real simple and God save me out of this trouble. Save me out of this trouble. Save me out of this trouble. Save me, save me, save me, God, out of this trouble. Save me out of this trouble. I need you to save me out of this trouble in Jesus' name. Save me out of this trouble in Jesus' name. Save me, God, out of this trouble. You said you'd save me out of all my trouble. Save me out of this trouble. I you said you would. I know you will. Thank you. Now I'm saved out of my trouble. My trouble's ended. I'm saved out of my trouble. Notice how I'm doing that, okay? I'm just kind of showing you what happens, uh, something similar in my prayer time. And, you know, you, you sometimes need to say it more than once. Not for God's sake, for your sake. You've got to convince yourself you've asked Him. You've got to convince yourself you're believing it. You've got to say it until your heart latches on and rings with that truth God's got. Until you get a confirmation that God has heard. See, when you, when you finally really trust, God will respond with a confirmation in your heart. What's the confirmation? It's something. You'll know it. Is it a word? It might be. Is it a feeling? It might be. Is it a sense? It might be. Might be all three of those. Somehow you need to pray until you know that you, you connected to God. I'm telling you, there's a way to go into prayer for one thing, ten things, big thing, little thing. And come out knowing God heard and answered. Yes. There's a way to do that, and you need to do it. You need to stay there with God longer than 30 seconds sometimes. Right. Till you know you connected. Uh -huh. Okay? So I'm trying to simplify it for you, but the simple thing is you need to pray and convince yourself. It's not to convince God. Some people are in this mode, this mode of praying uh, to convince God. I'm trying to prove to God that I'm worthy. I'm trying to say it enough. I'm trying to pray the right words. I've even added in a couple of these and thous. <laughs> trying to persuade God that I, that, I can get the, that I have enough faith to get the answer. It's not about convincing God of anything. Confessing Scripture and praying things and muttering them and saying them and focusing on them is not for God, it's for you. It's not to convince God, it's to convince you. You and I need to be convinced that He's our Heavenly Father and He'll answer. Amen. Yeah. Verse 7, The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear Him and delivers them. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear Him and delivers them. Did you know the angel of the Lord encamps all around those of you who respect God? Did you know the angel of the Lord encamps all around you? Did you know the angel of the Lord is not a little fat baby with wings? <laughs> Fluttering around, shooting darts. The angel of the Lord is, is, a, is a real angel. Amen. Fat babies with wings are not angels. Those are fat babies with wings. You've heard me go through that, right? The angel of the Lord is, is able. Yes. Yeah. He don't need a diaper change. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear Him and delivers them. And if you believe that, you wouldn't be afraid of anything. You wouldn't be afraid of any noise at night. Listen, this is important for you. I know a lot of you still deal with this at home. 
Or when you're away, you're, you're, there's some fear. Whether you're in your car or at your house, you hear something, you see something, and it scares you, it spooks you. Somebody's in the house. You, you, if you believe this scripture and you heard something, you would think, someone might be in the house, but that's okay. How about that? If the angel of the Lord encamps around you and protects you, who cares if somebody's in the house? What if it's a bad guy? Who cares? I'm protected. He just hadn't seen my angel. He hadn't got close enough yet. But half of you don't believe that scripture. I know. It's okay. If you did, though, you wouldn't be afraid of anything. Right. When you're laying in there at night and, and you think, is my, is my door locked? Did I lock the door? Did you lock the door? <laughs> you got to practice this. You got to, I mean, you got to spend a little time here and think. Does it mean that he would protect me even if the door's unlocked? Right. Yes. Thank you, Lord. This is real faith walking here. Yeah, it is. Not, not to do ridiculous things. It's okay to lock your door, but if you forgot and you don't want to get out of bed, you don't. <laughs> You don't want to get out of bed out of fear. Listen, you need to be moved by faith. You need to be moved by God. You need to be moved by the Spirit. Don't be moved by fear. Oh, we got to do that. Or if we don't do that, then the... That doesn't sound like a person trusting God. I told the story last night. I'll, I'll tell it to you. Uh, I heard a story of a, a lady who was driving a car and... Uh, or she was parked, and she got carjacked, basically. She got carjacked with her in it. And the guy who carjacked her, this is back maybe 20, 30 years ago, was a serial killer. And uh, they're driving down the road, and he said, I'm going to kill you. And she said, she said, oh, you can't kill me. <laughs> she said, you can't kill me because I love you. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you about Jesus Christ. <laughs> we just end the story right there. I mean, that's, that's how a person who knows God can act. And um, she said, here, I just want you to listen to what I was listening to. And she was listening to a, a gospel cassette tape from Kenneth Copeland, actually. And this is where I read the story. But it was a cassette tape. He's preaching the gospel. And, and after, after they're driving, this man's driving the car. And after a while, he, he, he stops the car and he pulls over and he says, what did you just say to me? She said, I didn't say anything to you. He said, somebody said something to me. She said, what did they say? He said, I just heard a voice that said, this is your last chance. I want to save you and be your father if you'll receive me. She led him to the Lord and he got saved. Oh, wow. Went and turned himself in. Glory to God. Lord. Isn't that exciting? Hallelujah. Preaching the gospel in the prison. They wanted him to appeal. He said, I don't need to appeal. And so he went to death row, got executed, and he, he didn't want any. He goes, I want to go see my Lord. That's all I want. <clears throat> we just got to believe the Bible. All right? Here's where some people fail. We read all these wonderful things. Um, well, let's read one more, and then I'll tell you. Look at verse 15. The eyes of the Lord, Psalm 34, 15, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to... Let's read verse 15 again. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. And His ears are open to their cry. Yeah. <clears throat> the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Skip to verse 17. The righteous cry out and the Lord hears. Yeah. And delivers them out of all their troubles. Yeah. I don't know about you, but I've had trouble. Now, I don't stand up here and go through all my troubles with you. And I especially don't go through all my troubles while I'm going through my troubles. I wait until I'm delivered so I can tell you about it. But Jesus said, see, this is where we have a little myth that Christians somehow buy into, that once you become a Christian, everything's going to be fine. Well, everything's going to be fine in your soul, and your heart, and your eternity. But it doesn't mean every world, everything in this earth life is going to be fine. Just the opposite. Jesus said if you're in the earth, you're going to have tribulation. In this world, you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. You need to know that all this mess that we go through is normal. Amen. Right. Right. Yeah. That's the truth. 
So being a Christian and having God as your Father doesn't mean that nothing ever will go wrong in your life. What it means is, is you have an advantage and that you have access to God so He can help you out of all that trouble. So He can preserve you, so He can keep you safe. That make sense? So here's the deal. Just when you think that everything is... Some people are re reserving their happiness until their troubles are over. Some people are putting off their joy and their full contentment in life until this trouble's over. Well, as soon as this is done, whew, as soon as... If God will answer this, whew, if God will finally bring my children, whew, if the job, whew, if the health... Whew, Boy, if this would, golly, I'm going through. When this is over, it's never going to happen that way. Amen. It's never going to happen that way. The scripture said, "Rejoice when you go through various trials." Yeah. You're supposed to be rejoicing during the trial. Yeah. Right. That's good. Yeah. That's good. He said, "Count it all joy when you fall into." various trials and temptations, knowing the trying of your faith works patience. It's not joyful. He said, count it joyful. Right. Yeah. It's not joyful. We're not talking about feelings of joy. We're talking about you counting it joy. Yeah. Going through it with some holy contentment and some holy, you know, stature. Yeah. Yeah. With that little look in your eye, glory to God, you That's just right. watch. <laughs> With, with at least a half a smile. I mean, we're talking at least a half a smile because you know something that the world don't know. See, when you trust God, you can do it. So you'll never, you'll never have a problem-free life. None of you. I came to church, so I'd have a problem-free life. <clears throat> Just when you, even if your life is pretty trouble-free right now, uh, at some point you're going to remember that your uncle is unsaved and going to hell. There's always somebody else to help. There's always trouble somewhere. So you get the picture. All right. Verse 18, The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart. Save such as have a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him Glory. out of them all. Glory. Hallelujah. So uh, you get to be delivered out of all afflictions. All afflictions. All right? So make sure you believe that. Make sure you know that. Don't get stuck, you know, trapped by the devil with this gloomy outlook on everything. Count it all joy when you're going through something. Get an, out, get an outlook that's expectant, that God's going to answer. Amen. Turn to Isaiah 43 with me. Isaiah 43. Just trying to show you how God really thinks about it. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Now, notice that scripture, it looks like, and you read this throughout the Bible, that uh, God favors the righteous. Isn't that true? Uh -huh. God favors the righteous, and this is where a lot of Christians fall flat because they don't understand righteousness. That's why we teach it here and explain it here and preach it and over and over and over again so that you understand what righteousness really is. Does everybody know what righteousness really is? Does everybody understand what it means to be righteous? To be righteous means you have right standing with God. In the Old Testament, the way to be right with God was to obey the rules follow all the commands, and if you failed them, you were called unrighteous. Well, everybody in this room realizes they've failed the commands of God to some degree. Therefore, under Old Testament standards, you would be called unrighteous. But because Jesus changed everything, Amen. now you can be called righteous. Yes. You understand? Uh-huh. And so we are now called the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Yeah, Jesus paid the sin penalty so you could be righteous. Mm -hmm. 
But this is what you have to realize, that you're not approaching God on your own. You're not approaching God in your own name. You're not presenting your works to God to see if they measure up so you can get something back. You're not earning anything from God. Not by what you say, do, or... You're not earning anything from God. So you should be able to trust God we should all be trusting God in the name of Jesus, not in my own name. Okay? When I approach God, He doesn't see me coming. If God saw me coming to the prayer room, He'd be like... If He saw me alone coming to His throne, He'd be like, keep him away. And that's how most Christians feel all the time. But we want to erase that from you. Because God doesn't see you coming. He sees Jesus and you coming. When God looks at me, He sees me through the veil of Jesus. So when he sees me coming, it's Jesus and me, and he says, Oh, there's my son. Thank you, Lord. And Chas is with him. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Mother son. Yes. Glory. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. He accepts me because I accepted his son. Without Jesus, I don't get access to God. But with Jesus, I get full access to God. Hallelujah. Without Jesus, I don't get any prayer answered except calling on Jesus to be saved. With Jesus, I get every prayer answered. Why? Because He is righteous. He's the only one that was ever perfectly righteous. That was such a, that's such a big deal. He did it. He fulfilled every command. He is the righteous and I'm in Him. Therefore, I'm called the righteousness of God in Christ. Does that make sense? So when I pray in the name of Jesus, and that's why it's so important. That's why if you're not in Christ, you don't get to use His name and you don't get a prayer answered. Mm -hmm. Anything you ask the Father in my name, He'll give it to you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Pretty exciting, isn't it? Yeah. In the name of Jesus, we get prayers answered because Jesus fulfilled everything necessary to be called righteous. And the righteous man gets everything. We didn't read it, but it says that in, in Psalm 34, the next scripture says, and not one of his bones is broken. Jesus fulfilled that. Remember that on the cross? They, were gonna, they crucified him, and the typical thing was to break his legs to help him die quicker. They decided not to. It looked like he's already dead. Why? Because he gave up the ghost. So none of his bones would be broken. He fulfilled every righteous man's scripture. And if you're in Him, you've fulfilled it too. So regardless of what you did or didn't do, you can still get your prayer answered. You don't have to come to God cowering to God. God, I really... Oh, I forgot. God, I didn't go to church last month. God, in the name of Jesus, could you... Oh, Father. Oh, I'm so sorry. You don't have to act like that. How many times have you entered your prayer closet... And the first thing that happens is you start remembering all your shortcomings that week. Now, now I know I hadn't been, and I know I hadn't been that good lately, but I promise. Pulling all that garbage. Why do people do that? Because they don't know who they are. They don't have any value in the name of Jesus. All their value should be in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. If it's too hard to trust an unseen Heavenly Father? Eventually it won't be, but if it starts out that way, or if it's too hard to believe in the name of Jesus, it's kind of a hard concept, at least believe the Word. Yes. Put your faith in the Word of God. The Word of God is God. Yes. He's as good as His Word. I'm as good as my Word. Isn't that what we usually say? Mm -hmm. Man's as good as His Word. If God said it, 
it describes His will. You can trust Him. He wants you to trust His Word. Trust His Son, trust Him, trust His Word. God is the Word. Jesus is the Word. We know that. So in the name of Jesus is in the name of the Word. And so that's why the Word is so important to you. And that's why Jesus said, If you abide in Me and My words abide in you, then you ask what you will and it shall be done for you. If you're going to get prayers answered consistently, you're going to have to know the Word of God. You, you, you'll have to know the Bible. The whole Bible? Yeah, good portion of it. The whole, how many scriptures? A lot of them. You're going to have to know the, the Word of God. You got to, to know God, you must know the Word. To trust God, you've got to know Him. To know Him, you've got to know His Word. You've got to trust His Word. He'll never let one of His words fail. God upholds His Word. He, why? He has to uphold His Word because He can't lie. If He said it, it has to happen. Wow. If, he said, if, G, if He said anything you ask in my name, Father will give it to you, He has to obey that. God has to obey His own Word. you realize that? Whatever God said, He is forced by His very nature of not being a liar. He is not a liar. He cannot lie. He is absolutely unable to lie. That means if He says it, boom, it does it. I mean, if he said pink elephant, boom, elephants would be pink. He did that with the flamingo. Boom. He got a little wild hair. Pink flamingo. And boom, there it was. It just whatever he says is absolute, never stops. So when he says, if you ask, believing, not doubting, boom, it's yours. Boom, it's mine. God will always honor his word. That's why we're trying to point people to the scripture. Trying to, you know, if you call the church office for some help, going to point you to the helper. Going to try to connect you to God. How? Through the Scripture. Right. Come on. Yeah. Hallelujah. Good. Where did I say? Isaiah somewhere? Isaiah 43, verse 1. But now thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I've redeemed you, I've called you by your name, you are mine. When you walk through the waters, I'll be with you. Through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you'll not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. For I'm the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Look at chapter 41, verse 10. Fear not, for I'm with you. Be not dismayed, for I'm your God. I'll strengthen you. Yes, I'll help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So if you need help, He'll help you. You need strength, He'll strengthen you. If you're afraid, don't be. Amen? Yes. Turn to Isaiah chapter 55. We've got to get into a habit of valuing the Word of God. God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. You ever heard that before? Yes. Certain preacher coined that phrase, probably several of them. Uh, but we like it. God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. That's trust. Okay? And that, it's not just a cute saying. Sometimes I'm a little leery of all these quotes that go on these days, just cute things and, you know, there they're, can be exciting, but it's got to be more than a quote. No, don't give me just a quote. Tell me what you know. Amen. So if you hear a good quote, make sure you know what it means. Make sure you got it in you. Make sure it rings true in you rather than just be a nice little flyby. God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. Uh, I was talking with a denominational preacher probably 15 years ago, but I'll never forget it. He said, he said you know, that statement sounds okay, he said, but I think it's wrong. It should be, God said it, and that settles it. Amen. That kind of sounds good, doesn't it? It gives more weight to God, doesn't it? Kind of sounds like we're honoring Him more, when in fact, it's totally unscriptural. That's right.
you have to believe it before it's settled. That's right. That's right. At least before it's settled with you. Right. Now, as an absolute truth, God said it and that settles it. But for it to come to pass in your life, right. you have to have the little part in the middle, I believe it. Yes, that's true. Then it's settled. Mm -hmm. yes. Amen. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So don't try to get cute with me. <laughs> My, my goal is not for me. It's to help you be that adept at the Scripture, at the Word of God, so that you're successful with God. So your spiritual life is complete, so that you're strong, so that you're not flimsy, so you're not flaky, so you're not moved by every wind of doctrine, so that you know your God. Yes. Yeah. We got to know our God. We got to know His ways. We got to know His will. We've got to be able to access Him when needed. Yes. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah. It's all about accessing our Heavenly Father on a daily basis. Yeah. we got to be able to trust God to get miracles to happen. That's fun. Yes. Sure. I gave up the fun of the world so I could have the fun with God. <laughs> if, we don't, if we don't value the right things, will miss God. Okay? Not valuing the right things diminishes the impact God can have on our life. We value lots of things in life. We value our time. We squeeze in a couple hours for God a week. We value our children. We value our jobs. value our money. value our pleasures. value our leisures. We need to value the Word of God. If you'll start valuing the Word of God, God will have a bigger impact in your life. Yes. Valuing it, esteeming it, giving time for it, giving the Word first place in your life. When something goes on, the first thought should be, what does the Word say? Yeah. When it's a relationship issue, well, what am I going to say to so-and-so? That's not what you think first. Your first thought should be, what does the Word say? Amen. It says, love your enemy, bless when they curse. Do good when they hate and persecute. Remember that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That solved half the problems. Uh, Kenneth Hagin tells this story. He was on his deathbed when he was 15 years old. And uh, searching the scriptures, learning some things. God was training him, teaching him some things of faith, how to trust, how to believe. And he came across Matthew chapter 6 in the passage of scripture where Jesus is saying over and over again, don't worry about your life, what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear, what you're going to uh, drink. Remember all that? And he says, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. Take no thought saying. And so it's all a big don't worry chapter, right? Or a portion of it. It's just a big don't worry section. And Brother Hagin got to that section. And he, and he thought, wait a second. I can't not do that. He said, my fam I come from a long line of warriors. My family's champion warriors. We worry. That's just who we are. I don't think I can do this. You see, you have to realize that some of, the biggest sin, some of the biggest sin involves you doubting God. Doubt is a sin. He called it an evil heart of unbelief. He said, if you doubt, don't, I can't let you think you'll get anything from the Lord. Remember, if any man lacks wisdom or anything, really, let him ask of God without doubting. Let him ask in faith without doubting. For he that wavers is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. Do not let that man think he shall receive anything from the Lord. If you doubt, I, I'll just have to tell you, you won't get it. If you pray and doubt, you won't get it. He said, don't let them think they're going to get anything. It'll just bring a false hope. Yeah. Doubting is bad. We think Christians, you know, got all this little list of sins. Smoking, drinking, cussing, chewing, whatever. <laughs> and we're like, feel so proud we don't do some things. What about doubting? What about worrying? Amen. Worrying's a sin. Did you know worrying's a sin? Mm -hmm. Say it out loud in case you didn't. Say worrying is a sin. Worrying is a sin. And so Brother Hagin got to this chapter. He said, Lord, I, I can't do that. This is way too hard. I have to worry. He said, matter of fact, I'm not even going to keep studying this chapter. He, said, he skipped over and started studying the Antichrist. This was his story. He said, I got to there. I thought, no. No, I'm just going to go study the Antichrist. He said, because I was familiar with that and it didn't bring any challenge or conviction to me. 
You ever known Christians that do that? They'll, get, they'll start majoring on stuff that doesn't bring any challenge or, 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 or conviction to their life. Get stuck in the end times, get stuck in natural Israel, stuff like that. Doesn't bring any conviction, just do some natural things. Visit some natural people. Pray some natural city prayers. That's good preaching. I've known friends that get stuck in there and don't, don't win one soul the rest of their Christian lives. Don't even try to win a soul. Can't be bothered with that. It's too scary. Okay, but that's... Let's, let's reverse back up in here so we can get to lunch. All right, here we go. Isaiah... Isaiah um, oh, but then at the end of the story is Brother Hagen finally realized, you know what? I'm going to have to repent of my doubt and my worrying. So we all need to. All right. Isaiah 55, verse 8. Here, here, this will help you uh, value the word and see how it works here. Isaiah 55, verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven... And do not return there, but waters the earth and makes it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. The word of God will work for you. One of these scriptures we've read today will work for you. It'll absolutely, it doesn't stand a chance of not working. That's right. That's right. If you use it, if you believe it. You get it? Yeah. Water comes down and it does its job. Right. As you've recently seen in the city, water comes down, makes all the grass green, makes all the trees grow, makes all the crops get healthy. Isn't that right? Yeah. I mean, unless it floods them, I understand. Makes all the golf greens green. The word spoken and believed out of your mouth will cause a miracle. Doesn't stand a chance not to. God said it. He said my word would never come void. Praise God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Brother James said to be doers of the word, not hearers only. Deceiving your own selves. You've got to take the Word of God and value the Word of God. And if you, you know, some people decide they won't commit to the Word of God so that they don't feel responsible to learn it and do it. Just because you stick your head in the sand doesn't mean you don't get poked in the rear. It's the truth, isn't it? I mean, some people are avoiding church so they don't have to feel the conviction. And they feel like they're okay and they're better if they're not in church. Better if you're not reading the Word. Better if you don't commit to it, then you're not on the hook. Huh? Je ne sais pas. Hallelujah. I'll close the book here. Tell you one final story. He's a dom denominational preacher. <clears throat> Back early 1900s, or somewhere in there, denominational preacher who didn't necessarily believe all these things, didn't value the word properly. But anyway, he was sitting in a charismatic, spirit filled meeting uh, where the power of God was and where they were preaching on being filled with the Holy Spirit and some signs and stuff was happening. And, the power of God came on him, and he began to speak in tongues. And here he is speaking in tongues, and the thought crosses his mind. Now, here's the deal. He was a, a very wealthy preacher, very well-known speaker, traveled all over the world with speaking to, to preach the gospel, and uh, had a lot of clout and a lot of popularity. But the Spirit of God came on him in this church, and he began to speak with tongues. And as he was doing that, these thoughts came to his mind, what are you going to do now? They're going to kick you out of your denomination. All your income is going to be gone. You're going to lose all your fame. And when those thoughts came and he accepted them, he said the anointing left. The Spirit of God 
left, the anointing uh, left him. And he said he left the building. He snuck out of the meeting. Resisting the Holy Spirit and the power of God and the evidence of tongues. Which is in the Bible. Which a lot of people have devalued for various reasons and various ways saying, well, that passed away and it's not for us today and all these other... And, and that's why we explain it and teach it and, it and really detail the scriptures that help people get it so that you don't have to miss the blessing of it. Yes. There's a great blessing, great blessing, great empowerment, great life change that takes place with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Everybody needs it. Every Christian needs it. Some people are hiding behind one little scripture that says, do all speak with tongues? Implying no, which is true. Uh, and they say, see, see, whew, whew, not everybody speaks with tongues. Ha, 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 I didn't want to anyway. <laughs> not realizing that that interpretation is wrong. When it's said, do all, do all speak with tongues, it's talking about in the middle of a congregation for someone to interpret. That's the manifestation of tongues, not the gift of praying in tongues. Make sense? Right. Not having a personal prayer language to God, which you can do anywhere, anytime, at home. No. That's talking about where all should be edified. The whole context is in a church setting context. Make sense? So anyway, people have hidden behind all sorts of things to avoid the supernatural. That's why most people do it. It's because the supernatural is hard to understand. We'd rather just play video games and watch sci-fi, and that's enough supernatural for me. The truth is, supernatural is real, but you do have to believe it God's way. All right. So anyway, this, this preacher left the building, and, and within a month, he got sick. Within a month, he got deathly ill. Now, some say, did God do that to him? No, 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 God didn't do that to you. God doesn't ever do that to you. Even if you're out of the will of God, He's not going to put a sickness on you. He's so good, God would never, never do that to His children. All right? What happens, though, is when we make decisions outside the will of God, sometimes in blatant defiance to God, what happens is the spirit world knows that. I don't know how that works, but somehow the spirit world knows it. God would know it, of course. Angels would know it, of course. The devil and demons somehow know that as well. And that gives him entrance into somebody's life. Remember the scripture that says... Uh, Satan could get an advantage over you. Another scripture says that we should, uh, that God perhaps would grant us repentance so that we may escape ourselves out of the snare of the devil by acknowledging the truth. Acknowledging truth helps us escape the snare of the devil. If you're not going to acknowledge the truth, then the devil can ensnare us. It's very clear. I mean, again, we're talking about supernatural things like devil. Yeah. But it's very real and it, and it harms lives, okay? And so this man got deathly ill because he blatantly refused a blessing and the will of God. And who knows how, how, how all that works in the spirit realm. But anyway, so he got sick and he got so sick he was almost dying, couldn't eat, couldn't take care of himself, decided to go live with his mom who was 80 years old. And where his mom lived was a, was a piece of property that had a little ranch hand on it, 19-year-old boy. And the 19-year-old boy began to take care of this man uh, because he couldn't take care of himself. So he had to feed him and bedside and all this, bedridden. And so one day the 19-year-old the boy was a new Christian, actually. And um, he, said, why don't, he said to the man, he said, why don't you just let the Lord heal you? And the preacher said, what did you just say? He said, why don't you just let the Lord heal you? He said, what do you mean? I mean, it's a preacher who never believed that God would heal or knew it, right? And the boy quoted James chapter 5, verse 16, that if there's any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church, and they'll pray over him, anoint him with oil, and the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And he quoted that scripture to the man, and the man said, that's in the Bible? Now you'd think that if you've been to seminary or Bible school, or if you're just a Christian who read the Bible, you'd have read the scripture. But if your heart's not open, and if you resist God, you'll just pass right over a lot of things like that. It'll just be so blind to you, you'll miss all the glory. It happens to people all the time. Their, their ears aren't there to hear. And so anyway, he said, that's in the Bible? The boy said, yeah. He said, where is it? The boy said, I don't know. I can't read. I've only heard my pastor quote it. He said, take me to the pastor. So the little boy, the 19-year-old boy took this man to, the, uh, to a meeting. It was a Brush Arbor meeting where his pastor was preaching the gospel. 
And the, the man said, the preacher guy sat in the car because he couldn't get to the meeting really, but he sat in the car with the door open and, and heard the preaching. And afterward, the preacher comes over to the car and prays for the man in the name of Jesus and commands him to be healed. It's in, the boy gets in the car and starts driving, back, driving the man back home. The man says, I'm healed. He gets home and he walks in and, and he finds his, his mother and he says, he says um, cook me some food. Cook me some biscuits and gravy or whatever, ham, whatever it was. And um, she said, but you're sick. He goes, no, I got healed today. She said, but how do you feel? He said, no matter how I feel, I believe the Word of God and I got healed. She feeds him. Turns out he's totally healed. Totally, completely healed. Gets to preaching again. But before he leaves his mom's house, the little boy said, I mean, the 19-year-old boy said, uh, hey, why don't you get baptized in the Holy Spirit? Speak with tongues. He said, I think I will. <laughs> Whole life was changed. Became a famous spirit-filled preacher after that. He finally valued the Word of God. Don't resist the Word of God. So many people are still intellectualizing God. Don't do that. Use your intellect to get spiritual. Use your intellect properly. It's okay to be smart. It's okay to have intellect. I like high IQs, sure. Just don't let them resist God for you. Let them help you understand God better. Thank you for joining us for the preaching of God's Word. We trust that your faith and your love for God is stronger than ever before. Chaz and Joni Stevenson have a New Testament vision of spreading the full gospel of Christ around the world, helping unbelievers meet Jesus Christ, and building strong Christians who can impact their world, and are doing so by preaching the uncompromised Word of God with the power of the Holy Spirit. To join us in that vision, please consider an offering to help with media costs, or an offering to simply show the value of the spiritual things you have received. You may give online, by mail, or by phoning in with a credit card. If you're in Houston, Texas, and looking for a good home church, Pastors Chaz and Joni invite you to a spirit-filled, life-changing service at Houston Faith Church, where we're certain you'll experience the love and goodness of God in a real and powerful way. For more information about God, Houston Faith Church, or Stevenson Ministries, please visit us on the web, where you can now watch services via live streaming and find many other life-changing resources, or download our Houston Faith phone app.